هاي انا جيسي رضوان سي او ان فاوندر كاريرا النهارده احنا معاكم في تاني ابيسود من مومنتم بودكاست والنهارده احنا معانا شازيا سيد شازيا از ذا جي ام اوف يونيليفر ليفون عراق ونورث افريكا زي ما انتم اتعودتوا معانا ان في مومنتم بنوري الرا سايد اوف ماذر هود بنوري ما وراء الكواليس من الستات الناجحه اللي احنا بنجيبها احنا فخورين جدا بالشراكه مع يونيليفر استراتيجيك بارتنر شيب معانا خلال السنه دي والنهارده احنا بنصور من يونيليفر اوفيس والنهاردة معانا من أوفيس يونيليفر شازيا سيد شازيا is the GM of Unilever Levant, Iraq and North Africa Welcome Shazia, it's a pleasure having you with us and um, I think everyone uh, knows your achievements, your successes and um, the amazing history you have here in uh, Unilever and not only history, it's ongoing successes and um, amazing milestones. Today, I think you've done a lot of interviews and, and you spoke a lot when it came to women and diversity, inclusion. Today, we want to show people more of what it's like to be a successful mother, a successful woman, kind of like the raw side of Shazia. Everyone sees the, the GM, the tough, the, the strong, independent, like we always say, strong, independent woman. I know most women now hate this word. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to go back and tell us more about your journey, how you started. I know you started in Pakistan, you're from there. I want you to go through, we were just saying that Technically, Unilever is like a home to you. You started there. It's been more than how many years? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot. 30 plus. You lost <clears throat> count. So I want you to tell us more about your journey, how you started in Pakistan. And this time, I want you to talk more from the heart. And I know this is an amazing couch. It's really, really comfy. <laughs> We can sit here and talk. Yeah, yeah. I actually almost slept <laughs> before you came. So I want you to tell us more about your journey. How, how did you start? Yeah. I think just before we start, you know, this whole um, thing that we have that uh, a strong woman leader and then a soft and gullible and harassed mother at home, right? I think when I, in my career, when I became a leader where I had people looking up to me and I was in a, in a position, you know, where people look up to you, I didn't let go of that that gullible side of mine. And a lot of people would come and say, but leaders are not like that. You know, yeah, but but you didn't raise your voice or you weren't strong enough. And I said, I'm sorry, that's me. So I was always very unapologetic and I didn't have two, two faces. Yeah, because that is, is what makes women really tired uh, of continuing because, you know, it's it's pretend it's pretending because you have to pretend what the world wants to see as a leader. So I think one of the things that I stuck to was never <laughs> that those two faces. I was always the, the mother uh, talking about my kids, integrating them with my, my priorities. And, uh, and you know, uh, that made it much more fun and easy for me. So just, just to comment on that. My journey with Unilever has been very long and enjoyable doesn't seem very long. It seems like yesterday. I still remember that time when I joined as a as a young management trainee in in Pakistan in 1989, October. You remember actually the month. <laughs> I remember the yeah. month. <laughs> yeah. In, in Unilever, we get, uh, you know, these presents when we complete a few number of years and that month. So that helps. But I do remember that uh, it was 8th October. Wow. <laughs> a memorable day. And there was a bunch of management trainees. We all joined together. And if I look back now, there's only me who is uh, 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 is left actually uh, from the lot. Uh, wow. The rest left uh, for various reasons. One went out of the country, one uh, left for, to be a banker, uh, another person left to be an entrepreneur and there was only me. And uh, nobody at that time, and, and when I look at that bunch, they were Uh, people and I was I was the the shy one hiding behind all of them <laughs> and so you know one never knows uh, how how what future holds for you 
so it's been an enjoyable one. I wasn't married when I joined Unilever and uh, in 89 and 91 I got married. Uh, the typical question that I had was, so are you going to continue? And of course, no, of, said, course. of course I will, uh, yeah, but I think, uh, you know, people were always validating that and asking, that was the most popular question, not about congratulating me for getting married, but mm -hmm. more about saying, so will you leave or will you stay? Um, and then um, my my husband was my best friend before that, so we've, we've been, we knew each other for long and and we love traveling. So in the first 10 years, we travel like crazy, We'd get our salary and, you know, run to any country and just spend, it, spend, yeah, spend <laughs> blow the money away. We were living with our in-laws, so no bills to pay. And uh, and people would often ask us that, oh, we're so sorry, you don't have kids. No, keep trying. And I was like, no, no, it's not that. But anyways, finally, um, um, I we decided to, okay, think about uh, having a baby. And then when I discovered I was pregnant, that was the same time, uh, literally the same week that I discovered there was, I was offered an, uh, a position in Vietnam. So, you know, uh, my my parents were freaking out, thinking, you know, she's crazy. She's going to, you know, how can she be pregnant and disappear somewhere, which we don't even know where it is. And is there a war in Vietnam? And, yeah. um, but I was determined. And uh, with my husband, you know, the other challenge always is that you were excited about your career. My husband was working with the HSBC in in Pakistan and he had his own career. So how do I sell this idea to him? So, you know, I was a little, uh, I thought about it. I was really bursting with excitement, but I played it down and I called my husband for lunch and I said, listen, I've got this offer, but I think I'm and not- And I'm pregnant. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, that was behind the scene, right? We had yeah. got over that excitement. But I said, listen, I've got this, uh, this uh, position, but uh, I don't think I'm going to take it because, you know, um, going to Vietnam, I don't even know where it is. And, and, but they do say that it's good for my career. And he was like, no, 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 wait, let's explore that. And I was like, are you sure? I'm, I'm not sure. And he said, no, no, let's, let's at least go and see it. So, you know, that was my little That's tactic. That's an amazing school, reverse psychology. <laughs> yeah, because- I should had, do it with my husband. <laughs> had I said to him, I want to go, he would have said, but what about my career? Yeah. Yes. But anyways, uh, I wanted him to be ahead of me in excitement because one of the things I've learned in my career so far has been that a, a position can never succeed if your family is mentally not uh, bought into the uh, the move. You know, it's not True. about your success. It's not about uh, uh, about the role. It's about a whole experience, and you have to take your family along. They have to buy into that. So that really helps. So I think this little tactic really <laughs> helps, and I do share it with people. Um, that's, uh, that's actually very smart because it, it taps on actually how men think. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> actually, yeah. I mean, well, if if you would have gone to him and said, "Oh, I got an amazing offer," he was gonna say, "What about my career? And what about yeah. kids?" <laughs> I was worried about his career. To yeah. be to be fair, because I think you know, if if I had killed his career and built mine, it would have uh, um, it wouldn't really have. I, I would have had a very frustrated person sitting at home, angry person, and that would not have helped. So what we what we did was we posed the question to uh, Unilever and Unilever has been is very encouraging that way. So anyways, when we went to Vietnam, luckily they, they arranged some interviews for him and he actually got uh, hired by HSBC in Vietnam. So it really worked out well for us. That's and it was a very exciting four years we spent there. Um, my son was, uh, you know, we had a, an excellent nanny who really helped. Uh, an interesting episode that I tell everybody is that when I went for a, what we call a look-see to Vietnam. Um, and I came back to have the baby to Pakistan. I called up uh, my office, you know, in a typical uh, Unilever manager mindset and said, listen, this is the uh, my son's name. This is his date of birth. And uh, please get give me the invitation because I had to get his visa sorted. And he wasn't born then. Huh. So they said, congratulations, you know. And I said, uh, no, 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 he's not born. I have just decided that I will choose this day to have the baby and, uh, and and this is the and I've already thought of the name to simplify life so please uh, go ahead and send me the invitation and they couldn't <laughs> believe it you know they thought I was crazy so anyways the the baby was born and we within 10 days you know I decided we and me and my husband we packed up and we went to Vietnam and and I said okay now the baby's born the the best part is done the difficult part is done now let me go to work so in 15 days, I went back to work wow. and, uh, and you know, 
Uh, and every woman knows this is really, really hard. I could not even remember my... Mentally, it's I, actually <laughs> physically hard. Physically, I couldn't, I couldn't remember my, my password. When I would yes, turn yes, on yes. the computer, I was blank and I would turn up at wrong meetings at wrong time. You know, so it was uh, those days when nobody really got into the details of, okay, the maternity leave and what is, you know, today I tell the girls you're blessed, you know, everything yes. is laid out for you on a, on a platter. Um, so, so I think that was an experience. And after that, I really tell uh, all the women that, listen, take, take your time. You have had a huge, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big thing to have a baby and your body needs that rest. Even if you think your mind is active, uh, please take that rest, force yourself to, to switch off and give your time to yourself and your health. And that was a learning. Uh, it did affect my health for, for a long time. Yes. It took the recovery much much longer, but uh, you learn. I want to actually pinpoint on what you said, having your family aligned with your career goals and, and who you aspire to be. And that actually goes to originally choosing the right partner that actually supports you. Like I see a lot, I see a lot of um, ambitious women who partnered with people who, who are actually ag against women who, who want to work, for example. <laughs> so what happens is that along the way, they find themselves suffering. They want to be very successful and they go on the successful, uh, the, the, the career ladder. But then the home falls apart. And what happens is that they fall apart at the end. And it's like a cycle. <laughs> so is there like different phases where, where women, um, let's say, for example, um, now my kids are three and seven, so it's much more chaotic than women who, <clears throat> who have older kids, like teenagers. So uh, a corporate life, for example, is much harder than other, other women who, ha who have old, older kids. So is it a, a black or, gray, uh, or white zone, or is it a gray zone or it's it's different phases of life. Like, what can you can you reflect on what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think, uh, look, the easy answer for this one is that look at life. Yeah, life is short. One wants to enjoy. One has to take all out of life. Yeah, live it to the fullest. And career is a part of it. So step back a little bit because I think sometimes we get you know as young. Uh, uh, people, we get overwhelmed by and we get consumed by career. Yeah? Career is a part of it and if you're unhappy 90% of the time and you come to work and that's fulfilling, that's not uh, a good report card to have for life, <laughs> right? I think happiness is far more important and whatever route that takes you. You know, there are surprises, very uh, strong career people marry and then they decide, no, 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 I'm getting much more fulfillment from being at home and being a housewife. That's all right. The second thing is that I, you know, one of the other thing that I, when management trainees join, I generally, uh, you know, have a chat with them and I say, listen, uh, guys, be relaxed. Career is a, is a journey, you know. One or two years are slow or, you know, you won't fall off the, the, the highway. Just, just bear, you know, be a little patient. Allow life to to in integrate with your career. There are there are moments where your children need you more. That's why Unilever offers a lot of creativity, uh, job sharing. You know, um, and if people go away for a year, uh, they can come back again. You know, we are after if if there is a strong person, a very intelligent person, just by being at home for a year, that intelligence is not going to reduce. So I think we have first of all. As, as women, we have to have confidence in ourselves. We have to step back and look at uh, life from a bigger lens, not just from a, a career lens, you know, and then see how, uh, you know, and I'll ask ourselves this question, how do I, wa uh, how do I want to be happy? Yeah, and, and, uh, and marriage, having children, such a beautiful thing, you know, uh, why do we feel guilty about it? Or we look at it as if it's coming in the way of our career. We have to enjoy every milestone as it is. You know, recently there was an uh, episode, there was, uh, we were, we were interviewing someone and that person was actually telling us, you know, I'm very nervous to tell you that I'm pregnant, I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm like, congratulations, that's beautiful. Uh, 
of course, you know that does not at all stand in the way so uh, of, of saying that you are hired or not hired or are you considered relevant for the role or not, you know that is that is something that uh, uh, is, is uh, what we as uh, you know people may turn around and say yeah, but some companies do not think like that. So, please only work with companies who think yes. or work with people who think like that. Do not let people who do not think like that dictate your life. So, take charge. So, I think what I tell women is be completely unapologetic about certain things yeah? and take the reign of your life in your hands. Do not let, you know, a lot of women say, I am very unhappy because my boss. Yeah, but your boss, come on, you know, you have more things in your life. If, if you are in, in an unhappy career, exit because that is impacting your personal life. You are going home and screaming at your children, <laughs> you know. So, so address it because women are in multiple roles, you know. So, it is very important that their life, that it, it is in sync, otherwise it is miserable and it takes a toll on our lives and we have all been through those phases. We learn, you know, I am not saying I did everything right. I had all those phases, made mistakes, but that is why I am here sitting here and advising women that listen, be completely unapologetic about certain things uh, and uh, it is great to have, uh, you know, enjoy those milestones in life. It is nature, enjoy uh, maternity leave, enjoy, enjoy having uh, children in, you know, all those milestones, uh, birthdays, being, you know, uh, uh, parent teachers, teacher meetings later on, all those things are memorable part of some, most of them, uh, if we try hard, we can make, make, um, be there. For our children. And especially those moments, uh, they, I always say the personal moments like your kids' birthdays, uh, their soccer uh, matches, and they, they, they do not um, come and go. They just, when, when the memory is done, it is done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but work at the end of the day, um, you can start working at the age of 60 and, and still be successful. Yes, <laughs> so, so absolutely. That's what I completely b believe in. I, I never let these things bother me, uh, honestly. Where they did, I fought back yeah? because I lived, I think one of the things that I'm asked very often, how did you survive such a long career? Yes. We're having kids and family. And I said, listen, I lived on my own terms and I was never apologetic about the fact that I, it's a very important meeting, but I have a, a child who's uh, Say, can I would have this conversation with anyone who would not understand. Luckily, I had supportive bosses, but where I found any resistance, I was absolutely black and white about it, that this is my priority and I have to be there. I'm sorry. It, it was not planned. It happened. If my child has 104 fever, <laughs> uh, I have to be there, you know. You set boundaries. I just uh, followed my, my instinct. Okay, talking about what you mentioned, um being a supportive company. I wish back then when I was graduating uh, from university, there was like some sort of an awareness for, for, for who are the companies that actually can support women and, and um, help them through their journey in all their phases. Mm -hmm. We don't have this kind of awareness in general in Egypt or in the Middle East or, or even in, in Maybe, maybe in, in, the, in the US or Europe, it's better. But here, if I would have gone back in time, I would have actually joined the people who I've seen supported other women and actually um, walk the talk. So I want to actually get into, I want to show people how Unilever actually helps those women. What do you do for them? How do you help them through their phases? Yeah. If, so Starting think, from being a yeah. young... Um, okay, so uh, look, uni <coughs> Unilever, uh, these policies, first of all, these policies, uh, the policies that we grew up with were made probably by men. Yeah, So they were policies which were true for everyone. And I think the first thing was to start looking at things from the lens of, uh, or all the tension points, Yeah, which were, which were, we were very clear that we wanted uh, we want uh, a balanced workplace, an inclusive workplace, which has uh, equal amount of women and men, because then it is it, we get great decisions, we get a great culture, inclusive culture, and that's why that is the reason. 
then of course if you want to invite uh, because right now everywhere it is a journey to get 50 to 50 percent uh, women uh, workforce in the in the workplace so before we open our doors to uh, to that journey we have to make sure that our policies are in place because it is easy to hire but difficult to retain yes <laughs> And why it's difficult to retain is because when you hire women, initially you sell Unilever and we, women will come. But then when they hit their first, uh, uh, you know, tension point or they're pregnant and they find that there is no policy, um, etc., those, those policies, they will leave. So all those efforts would be wasted. So actually, when I, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we believe is that hiring is easier with a brand like Unilever, but retaining is where we have to put in a lot of effort. So a lot of things that we look at, so I'll give you a few uh, headlines. One is, uh, you know, so what are the tension points? We have, first of all, these workplaces were not used to having women in place. Uh, so that means that men were not used to working with women. And when they start working with women, then they do not, or women don't know how to interact with men and men don't know how to interact with women professionally. So what happens as a result is that uh, there is harassment. There are those episodes that happen um, <clears throat> which result in harassment. So first of all, we have to make sure that all those our policies take care of, uh, the, uh, of that and protect the women as they enter the workplace against harassment. Yeah? Uh, secondly, I think, you know, uh, hold hands with them as they go through their life they get married, they get um, uh, their first child, their second child, uh, their mental health, and also for men. Yeah? Uh, so to make it inclusive, you know, so we focus on a lot of these. We have policies. We were the first ones to flag uh, six months uh, maternity leave. We also have paternity leave. We want to encourage men to take that paternity leave. Yeah? That's amazing. That's really have, yeah. <laughs> they need it as of well. Of course. I mean, I think <laughs> at that point of time, more than mothers and mother-in-laws, uh, wives want their husbands to be with them. Uh, and it's also a very good bonding experience. And men firsthand learn uh, to bond with the child as well. It's important. It's very important. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and also men realize what a difficult thing it is to give birth. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I think, um, Alhamdulillah, very happy that we have uh, great policies, uh, you know, and uh, we are the flag bearers in that and we want to continue to be that. And the reason is not that we, we want Unilever to be the best in, in, in class. The whole idea is that we want to talk about our policies. We want to inspire uh, the community and the other, other um, companies to, to uh, take these policies. It's no, you know, I mean, just a few women at Unilever benefit and the whole of, uh, let's say, Egypt doesn't have that, then it's no good. So I think for companies like, like ourselves, and we're not the only one, there are a couple of other companies which also have uh, amazing policies. I think we need to talk about those much more because it is these little, little things uh, which make um, it so easy for women and comfortable for women to join. And once they're comfortable, their children are taken care of, uh, they're healthy mentally and physically, they're not feeling harassed or insecure they give their 100 or I would say 200 yes, percent. Yes, I agree. So it's an amazing business case, uh, uh, you know. So I know we, I'm sure you worked on a lot, like thousands of initiatives here in Unilever. What was your favorite initiative towards women and, and something you actually felt it, it, it got you emotional? You felt that you changed a life of even one woman or yeah, something that I'll quote you an saw incident, the change yourself. Um, and, you know, um, one policy that we are working on here is uh, there are a lot of single women, um, uh, and we we don't have to date a policy for single women, single mothers. I would say, sorry, not single women, mm -hmm. single mothers. Yeah, it's an extremely tough task. In my career, when my husband was not with me, and I moved to Sri Lanka for one year, he was not with me, and I would, I was going nuts. You know, it was so difficult. Work was so easy as compared to managing my yeah. children at home alone. They were uh, so, you know, I hats off to the single women and we need to have a, a, a sorry, I keep saying single women, uh, single, single mothers. Moms. We really, really need to have uh, policies to facilitate and recognize single mothers. Yeah. 
So that's one piece that I'm work we are working on as an organization. And, and I think we really want to have that policy in place and then talk about it and, and uh, populate that in, in the country and in the region as much as we can. Uh, the second one was that, you know, in, I, uh, in, in Pakistan, we had uh, a bunch of women came to me. I was in sales at that time and, and my sales, uh, uh, women in sales, they came to me and said, you know, we, we, we just want to talk to you. And I said, what, hap what happened? So they said, listen, you know, when we travel, if somehow we can get our children if, uh, with us, you know, we'd be so relieved because it's this whole thing. I, I know I have to be in the market. I have to travel. It's the call of the job. But I do struggle. We do struggle because my mother-in-law or my mother sometimes cannot look after our children. Um, so, you know, especially the small children, you know, and those women who had two children or under the age of three, you know, it is very, it makes me very anxious. I'm distracted and I want to run back home. So I said, what do you think is the right uh, right policy? And they said, well, if I can somehow get a companion, uh, I can share the room with the companion, you know, my husband or my sister or even my uh, my nanny. Yeah. And if my child can travel with me, so I said, OK, done. <laughs> <laughs> Great, because I couldn't have thought of that. And you uh, if that is going to get 100 or 200 percent out of the visit, you will travel freely. You will be happier and you will come back much more, uh, you know, uh, happily. Then let's do it. What's stopping us? It's a small cost as compared to yeah. the gain. So I think, you know, that's that's an example. Uh, so it has to be relevant to wh whatever. And daycares are also uh, uh, something that we, you know, in, in Pakistan or even here, we've just started a small daycare. In, in When I was in Pakistan, when we started the daycare, even when the women were uh, traveling, they would send the children to the daycare because they said it gives them the structure that we want yeah. and we feel very safe and we feel secure that our children are in the daycare, Unilever daycare. So I think those are the things which are small things, but make a big difference yes. uh, to our, our working. Amazing. <laughs> okay. Talking about Pakistan, I know in Pakistan, you, it's, uh, it's similar to Egypt when it comes to um, stereotypes and uh, cultural norms, very strong cultural norms. So I want to st I want you to take us through the journey of going from local to global. Uh, how did you manage the, the 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 difference in the cultures? You've been through a lot of uh, different cultures mm -hmm. and different norms and different languages. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah I've traveled a lot. Tell us more about that. Look, first thing is that you have to enjoy it. You have to want it. Some people want to be in their, uh, they don't like to travel outside their country. And that's fine. That's the way they are. You know, they say, no, I am not mobile. I want to be here and I'm okay with the choices that are here, which is fine. I was always the restless one. So <laughs> I wanted it. So first thing is when you want it, then you, then you make extra effort to make it a success. Second thing is that when you move around, you have to, when you go into another culture, you have to have the curiosity and the respect for that culture. You can't come here and say, yeah, but I did this or I do this. But in back home, we did this. You have to respect the culture. You have to learn uh, to understand the culture and integrate with that culture. And anything that you do has to be culturally correct. Yeah. Uh, so I think once you do that, you really start enjoying it. And I've enjoyed all my experiences a lot, you know. All the countries that I've, I've taken, you know, I loved the countries, the beauty of it. I loved uh, meeting people there, understanding their, their uh, uh, how things work, their um, culture, people, you know, food. So, so I think that that is a, an amazing experience. Do you like the food in Egypt? <laughs> I love it. I love koshiri, by the way. <laughs> I was sure you were going to say koshiri. I'm a rice person, so I love koshiri. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So when we're talking about different continents, cultures, uh, different um, geographics, you're responsible for Levant, North Africa and uh, Iraq. Those three areas are actually very different, uh, mostly Arabs, but very, very different um, cultures and different way of um, of um, women are, are they, they share similar challenges but different in, um, in, in the way they're brought up. 
So how do you manage to execute the diversity and inclusion differently in, in big areas where you have several countries with uh, very, very different um, mindsets? Yeah, I think what would probably, uh, to me, it's not a surprise, is that anywhere you talk to the women, you know, anywhere in the world, the common tension points are the same. Yes. You know, if you go into the bathroom and there's a lady who's cleaning the bathroom and you strike a conversation with her, you start talking about work, her work and say, okay, she'll talk about how her child doesn't listen, is not doing, you know, how my son is uh, not listening to me nowadays. I'm worried about his, his school or, um, you know, I get back late and my, or, you know, I have to cook something and, or various tension points and to me that's amazing you know once i was invited to uh, a cfa conference to speak uh, in san francisco and i was in pakistan uh, the head of cfa was visiting pakistan and he invited me to talk and i was like are you sure i'm from pakistan how would i be relevant how would my experiences be relevant to the us women you know and when i and he said you'll be surprised and when i went there and i was talking and you know there was a woman, she wrote a note for me and saying, you know, I was crying when you were talking uh, about your son because my son is, a, is a, a borderline ADHD and he really was much tougher than any of my assignments and any of my projects. So, so I was quoting one of the experiences uh, and she said, you know, I have an ADHD son and, and the struggles, I was actually crying. So she wrote this note for me and I was very touched. So one of the realizations that I have is that... <clears throat> You know, we're all the same, honestly, take away all the differences, geographical differences, cultural differences. Um, we all talk about our mother-in-laws. We talk about our, our, our <laughs> marriage, our children being, you know, uh, what we cooked last night, you know. So I think it's all, it's, it's, there is, you know, maybe minor tweaking difference, but same we can, <laughs> that is why women connect <laughs> super <laughs> yes. amazingly well. So I, I, I honestly feel that there is no difference when we address some of the things. Obviously, the, some, some countries have better infrastructure that we have to build, some have not. Um, but, you know, if I, if I, for example, I talk about harassment, yeah, I think it's, it's totally wrong to assume that harassment is only in, in, uh, in countries or in which are not developed. It is, it is a phenomena. If you want to, if you want to encourage women to come to workplace, my rule of the thumb is assume there is harassment until proven otherwise. Yeah. So I think that means that until and unless we keep our, we don't keep our eyes open and have policies in place to address harassment, don't expect that there will not be harassment, be it any country, any geography. Yeah? So I think uh, that is, uh, my own very strong belief, which I've learned from my experience. It's, it's actually true. Uh, when we do a lot of research uh, at Karirha uh, about women and mothers, we find that despite the, 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 the huge differences in the backgrounds and in the income in the, in, the, in the education, it's always the same uh, pain, the same problems that they share. And, um, and, and this is why actually women connect regardless of, of any yeah, background. Absolutely. So, and this is why we really support each other because we, we know what it feels to, to be in, in others. And you know, place. on the other side, uh, there's an interesting one that um, generally I would spend a lot of time mentoring women at work. For example, the new bunch of management trainees, the first ever CD sales uh, managers that we would hire because it was a new position. Uh, they would come with that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of baggage thing. Okay, I'm a woman. Will I be able to match up or will, you know, uh, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. So, so the first thing I do is, you know, when we gather, they expect that I will start talking about, you know, girls, we have to do this. I talk about work. Yeah. And it is a little bit of a shock and they say, yeah, but I, you know, I say, listen, guys, this is our vision. This is our target that we have to do. And then. I'm going to facilitate you with a lot of things which will help you uh, flourish here. So I don't want them to carry, I don't want women to carry that whole thing, uh, you know, that baggage on their head all the time and <laughs> yeah. feel like, you know, okay, we are going to be, 
uh, superior citizens here because we are women and we are plagued by all these problems. Policies will take care of that. It will be an open culture. You can, you, you, you have to, you have to, you can talk about it. You can address, uh, you can come and speak about any problem. But at this, uh, on where it comes to work, or it's an inclusive place and you are going to deliver what uh, your male colleague is going to deliver on the targets. So I think when you start, you know, one of the other things I talk to women about is that when it comes to work, there is no divide. <laughs> So, you know, we speak the same language, so don't uh, sort of, uh, yes. yeah. Okay, talking about uh, baggage and emotions and 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 what it's like to, 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 to have the, the person in life and everyone has their own problems and at work. I understand um, about your son uh, because I have my three-year-old, he's very, he's very hyper. And I think he's going to be <laughs> ADHD as well. So I, I want you to, to, to talk to, to women who have kids who, who have learning disabilities or, or who, are, who are suffering on, a, on an emotional level, on a mental level. Um, I think this is amazing because um, a lot of those women, they put excuses on their kids uh, no, it's because I couldn't achieve because uh, my kid has X or Y or Z's, so I couldn't uh, have time for myself. But you didn't leave yourself to, to, to any excuse and you didn't leave yourself to, to say, um, I, I can't do it. Yeah. So look, ADHD uh, child is equal to two children. Yeah, that tough. So. I think very early on, I realized the, the signs of because he was hyper and disruptive in school. Even when he was two year old, it was in Vietnam. I would go and observe him from the window when he was sitting in a Montessori because he was supposed to sit still. And it's very difficult for children, yeah. ADHD children. He would be either poking the child next door or <laughs> next sitting to him or elbowing him or, you know. So I could notice that he was disrupting, that he was distracting. And these were the comments that I would hear back. So I investigated, I was curious. And once I, I started learning about ADHD, you know, I, my, my irritation or my, my trying to tell, to keep my child, con, you know, conform to the rules, Society. I started getting sympathetic towards him. You know, they said, imagine having a library with a bad, uh, with a bad librarian. So there's a lot of knowledge in there, but there is no, it's not organized well. So there is chaos up here, you know. Once my child came to work and he, he came in and in a minute he said, there is one desk without the computer, you know, and that little detail he noticed in five seconds, which nobody could even pay attention. <laughs> but his mind does not prioritize what is important information and what is not. So once I started realizing that, I realized how tough the journey was for him, you know. There was so much stimulus in class and he was, he could not focus. So I started talking to the school and they were a little taken aback. They said, you know, in those days, ADHD was not talked about even no now. No one even understood yeah. it. <laughs> so, so they said, you were the first mother who's so open about it and coming and talking about it, you know. And I said, listen, I need my help. So he has to sit closer to the blackboard. He has to, he always used to be made to sit next to the teacher. So the teacher could point him and, you know, keep an eye on him. And at some times uh, he needed a helper in the class who could help him one on one because he could not, he was lost. Halfway through he would be lost in the class. Uh, and, and there were times when I switched schools because there was time when he was punished almost every single day for little things like he didn't stand in the line, you know. And a lot of schools are, conf you know, focused Both on schools, discipline. Huh? They don't understand. <laughs> So, so I think it was a very good school and I had to take this very hard decision, but I took it in a, in a blink because I said, I don't want my unha a child unhappy. And I moved in into another school and I was, I actually cried in the principal's office. I remember that instance, you know, he was, a, a, and he said, don't worry. I said, listen, this is, this is the problem that I have. And uh, my child has been harassed and I don't want this. I will put him in home. I will not give him any education. If you think you can handle him, please only take him. And he's, he, 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 he went ahead and he said, you will be surprised how talented these children are. And from, you know, he was a happy child. I noticed a difference in all this. And, um, and uh, you know, I, 
Then later on, uh, when it came to, uh, you know, I went to Sri Lanka and when I came back, there was no place in his old school. So I put him in a regular school. And again, the same theme happened. He was punished a lot. And one day, uh, you know, and punished in terms of simple things like, you know, these kids have a ve very strong sensories. So when they, they anything touches, any hard thing touches their skin, yeah. they, they want to take it off. So my son would open his button of his shirt and that was what he was getting punished for. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I could see the same theme and I wrote a letter to the, and he was in, this was 10th grade, very senior class, 9th grade. I wrote a letter and said, I think uh, your school is not designed for my son and my son is not designed for your school. Thank you for your help and uh, bye bye. <laughs> I, I will be taking him out tomorrow. Yeah. And I actually sent that letter. I took my son back and from for two years, I homeschooled him. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I organized amazing. the structure. Every subject teacher would come in. You know, and he would get the breaks he wanted and everything and uh, it worked. I mean, he was so happy. He was a happier child. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was, it's been a very tough journey with him, but we have to recognize that it's tougher for the child than us. Yes. And in, the, in handling an ADHD child, I'm sorry, I'm talking about it, but it's such an important topic yes, of that course. a husband and wife have to be absolutely speak one language because often the other people point fingers and say it's a spoiled child. He's a spoiled or she's a spoiled child. A naughty child. It is, it is. You spoiled him, her, because these kids, you know, they throw tantrums. They get stuck on things. They're impulsive. So you have to just speak. And, and they do require a lot of discipline. They do require an airtight routine. So, yeah, I could go on and on. <laughs> amazing. That's amazing. And you actually homeschooled him while you were working? Yes. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, talking about children, I see a lot, not a lot, like, I mean, 100% of moms, not even 99%. They have the, the problem of the, the, the working mom guilt. And I feel like it never, ever stops, whether they're starting, whether they're in the middle of the journey, whether they're at the end. It's always ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. Yeah, you know, uh, two things I, I noticed. It's very easy for me now to to tell uh, tell women out there, but they will never believe me. I can <laughs> tell you that. Yeah, two things that young mothers would always come and talk. Um, you know, I would have these conversations when the mother was coming back from the maternity leave. I would always touch base uh, with her and say, how's it going? Uh, and she was keen to bring her child uh, back with her to the daycare. And I was like, Child is too young. You have been infrastructure. You've got your mother-in-law. Yeah, but I want my child brought up my way. Yeah. Hmm. So I would say, listen, uh, you know, you won't believe me, but actually for the child, sometimes it's better to be uh, at home uh, with the mother-in-law, receive yes. that love, rather to be put in school. All their life, they're going to be in schools and colleges. This is their home time, you know. Let them, let them be. And it's this whole possessiveness, uh, territorial young mothers you know and unfortunately uh, it's very difficult unless you you learn and now i can reflect back and um, you know talk about it and share my learnings but very you know it's very difficult for young mothers to let go of so once you tap into your infrastructure it becomes much easier but does the guilt stop so the second thing is uh, the guilt yeah yeah and now i can uh, i can tell you is that uh, you know there are mothers who would come to me and say Listen, you know, yesterday evening, my child was throwing a tantrum. They were so clingy. There was a uh, school telling me that the child is missing you, mentions you a lot. I think I'm going to, I'm going to quit. Yeah. I think the guilt is eating me up. My child is suffering. I'm going to leave. So I said, listen, you know, uh, what is that tension point? You know, first of all, I think you've been working too hard. You've been staying at work. You, you've gone from one end of the pendulum and now you want to go to the other extreme. There is a midpoint, yeah? If you think that your child is going through a phase where they need more of you or you've been away too many times, you've been traveling a lot, you know, provide that balance. Try and see how he or she reacts with some balance, you know? That's why our agile policy where women, we are working from home now. So children, you you are, you, you know, you get to spend much more time with the with the children and the mothers and are loving it, you know? And the children are loving it. We get, we are more in control of our, lives so i think a lot of times once we we did this we realized that yeah it's possible it's actually not so bad 
so i think guilt there is a there is a way to manage that and now when i look at it i see that my children the children are very resilient they move on and here the young mothers leave they everything they forget about us when they're old they forget about us yeah <laughs> and they go so to their friends we sit home we choose to stay at home not entertain not go out because we our children are missing us and children recover overnight <laughs> you know and they move yes. on so please live your life uh, you know don't pause press the pause button for too long children are more thick skinned they are resilient they go they are fine they grow up fine so please if you be, you know i can tell you from my experience you know i was a working mothers a mother i traveled a lot but i did spend a lot of time i did my own formula uh, and i um, you know pressed that pause button when i felt things were going the water was over my head and things were too much for me and my children uh, you know sometimes it does happen and then i would press the pause button and that helped me mental my mental health was better my children were calmer things were in control and i i was more relaxed so if if no one is actually listening to us now and uh this is between yourself and shazia and only shazia mm -hmm. do you really really believe in work life balance no okay why i think this uh it depends on what is balance balance is different to everyone I think it's about the 80 to me I've always followed the 80 20 principle yeah when I'm there I'm much I'm very differently there than any other mother I can uh, in my ch children's uh, you know friend circle so I add I feel I I feel that I can I can really and I think perhaps I shouldn't compare yeah but I feel that when I'm there I'm there I make a I make a mark on my child's mind that i'm there and i've made a difference yeah so that is more important than just being there a fly on the wall and and children thinking she's there okay but they go out yes. so when I, for example you know i go every weekend um from here to to london i travel every weekend and i tell my children listen i'm coming two days for you guys so i be high maintenance yeah i'm yeah. high maintenance then and that's important by the way ha huh? women are very low maintenance and i think we need to be high maintenance yes. so i tell my my daughter you know uh, that it, it's a, it's difficult for my son because now he's grown up and uh, but i tell her that listen i'm here for you and uh, i don't want to compete with your phone and you please don't have uh, uh, too many play dates those days it's my time and your time we do these bonding things we go out we eat together we shop together and we spend amazing time together and i know everything about school that week what's happened we do homework together and i think those two days are much more impactful than the whole week that would i, I would have spent with her yeah. so i feel i do follow the 80 20 principle and uh, then i make sure that i'm completely there uh, and i switch off i have the ability to switch off quality versus quantity quality versus quantity and i think you know it's interesting it's not me women can switch off because there's so many other things they have to attend to that they switch off so when we go into our homes i don't worry about uh, the work crisis or something unless there is something that needs urgent attention there is much more urgency of what's for dinner um, yeah. my, you know things like that which uh, which uh, which take up my uh, attention okay last question is always an emotional question mm -hmm. So we want you to imagine that now you're in the living room, okay? What is your favorite place in the, in your house? The living room or uh yeah, okay, the living kitchen, room. Kitchen actually. <laughs> kitchen, okay. <laughs> Let's make it the, the living room with a new kitchenette, okay? Yeah. And you're eating your favorite plate. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite plate? My favorite plate uh biryani. Yeah, I don't know it, but <laughs> rice, <laughs> rice. Okay, and now your kids. Now you're ninety years old. You finished your work journey. I'm how old? Ninety. Nine zero. <laughs> okay. And your son is is gonna be. He's twenty uh, three now. Okay, so let's say he's gonna be. 
with your grandchildren and your daughter as well. She's going to have a grandchild and they're going to look like you. <laughs> I want you to, to, to imagine you're sitting with them and you, you, you want to reflect back on your life and you want to show them how, how much you're, you're, you're proud of them and how much you, you gave to them. What will you say to your son? I think uh, be who you are because he knows that journey and, I, and never be shy or never be apologetic to pull back when you can't take it. Yeah. So, for example, I think those episodes that I had where I held his hand and walked out of the school because I knew it was not good for him. Yeah. Uh, I think that state that is a lesson that was for him. Even now he's fine. He's finishing college. I always keep the door open for him. You know, I always give him that option. Do you think you can manage? You know, yesterday I had to pay the fee for the last semester. So I, I said, I called him up and I said, are you sure it'll, you will need to go to college every day because he's on the college visa and it, he requires 75% attendance. So I, I always keep the door open for him. So I always say, don't judge from every, everybody's lens. Every person is different. Yeah? You were different. You had a different path. And yet you, you're successful. So everybody has some hidden talent. My daughter is different than my son. And, uh, and, you know, I think we need to give respect to everyone and keep, you know, be flexible. I believe I can change course without any problem. Yeah. And that's been my uh, success story because I have never been uh, worried or scared to change course. So let's say uh, I, I can give you an incident. Sorry. Uh, you know, I was in Vietnam and I had a, I had a boss who was uh, unfair to me and I, I I actually said, I'm leaving. I'm going back to Pakistan. This is not what I came for. And I will. I said, I will go home tomorrow, uh, today. I will pack my bags and tomorrow I want to go back home because I don't think this is what I uh, signed up for. So when I, you know, and then we had a conversation and things uh, were fine. But I am willing, I, I don't worry about changing course. If things get, you know, uh, against what I had, uh, I think are not right for me. So never be afraid and I al and always support your families and your people when they come back and say, listen, I think I can't do it. You know, always encourage them. Okay, let's look at other options. Don't worry. Yeah. And when you say don't worry, you know, they start thinking about, oh yeah, it's possible. Actually, I can. Yeah. So I think this really helps, helps people uh, keep the door open. That's my message. Keep the door open for them. Don't close doors and have only one door and tell people you have to only walk through that door. That is scary. And that brings about a wrong behavior. Amazing. It's really, really our, our pleasure having you with us. Thank you. And I think um, everyone can see why you're successful. You, you, achieved, you achieved a lot. It's because this kind of flexibility in your life, not being afraid to, 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 to go in a certain stereotypical path that everyone goes through. You have your own boundaries, you have your own um, standards, and, and this is what actually makes you different. So it's really a pleasure having you, and Thank I you. hope you really enjoyed today, and I hope it was from the heart. Yeah. It's and my it's my first podcast and my children will be very proud of it, by the way, <laughs> especially my daughter. So uh, very excited to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our pleasure. <laughs>